exercises that one would have to undertake in order to make such a leap, if indeed it was a leap. The best one can do is to visualize the sort of experiences, misfortunes say, or even revelations, which might bring about a change of mind. But that's hardly a leap, and some people might simply regard it as a lapse. Now, admittedly, there are things that I believe in without being directly acquainted with them. For example, I've never actually seen a coelacanth with my own eyes, but I believe in them. Also, I believe that the Earth goes round the Sun, although it certainly doesn't look as if it does. I take these things on trust, for the simple reason that I recognize the authority of the people who say that they do. But then, on the other hand, you get a whole range of dubious entities, such as ghosts, witches, spirits, and immortal souls, which I don't believe in at all. But the people who do believe in them don't necessarily do so on the basis of trust or authority. The psychological origins of such beliefs can be traced back to certain predispositions that we all share simply as human beings. The anthropologist Pascal Boyer has written at considerable length about the origins of the religious impulse in human beings. I think there are major themes that you'll find in most religions in the world, but those things are not the things we're familiar with. So um, a concern for who created the world, for example, is not one of them. Uh, a concern for mortality, uh, what's happening to me after death, is not one of them in a surprising way. Um, but the presence of unseen agents in the environment is one thing that you'll find everywhere. You'll find that there is some notion that there are spirits, ghosts, ancestors, um, agents of that kind that are sort of what I call counterintuitive because they're not like you and me or animals. They, are not, they don't have a physical body, but they have all the characteristics of agents like a mind, intentions, and so on. According to Pascal Boyer, this notion of unseen agents is not quite as counterintuitive as it might seem. It may actually be hardwired into our brains. In a primitive community, the accidents and misfortunes that inevitably happen make more sense if it's assumed that somebody or something actually intended them to happen. And strange coincidences, which are often genuinely hard to explain, make more sense if it's assumed that there is some hidden intention behind them. And those assumptions are often still made today. It may seem strange to suggest that we are hardwired to suspect that we are threatened by potentially malign as opposed to merely harmful forces. But there may be good selective advantage to this tendency in a world in which you're surrounded by predators. Although there's always the possibility of making embarrassing mistakes and over-attributing agency, seeing intention where there's none at all, it's worth making the occasionally embarrassing false positive when the alternative is the catastrophic false negative, in other words, when you land up being lunch. And it's only one short step from avoiding genuine threats to believing that other misfortunes may also be the result of malign intentional forces, that they may be the result of hidden, even invisible intentions directed against you. Now what is it that makes that religious as opposed to what one might call, or what some people might call pejoratively, superstitious? Well, it's your choice of terms, mm. and I think it's just a human phenomenon that corresponds to what we generally call religion. I mean, what we tend to call religion is more this sort of institutional framework that uses those beliefs or that uh, fosters those beliefs. Uh, but really, those beliefs are there, institutional or not, and they're there in very simple societies where you don't have a church. Uh, but that's just one of the features. Another one you'll find is um, a propensity to organize rituals. Uh, to get together and do a whole set of things that are directed at those 
on scene agents in an organized way with a script that has to be rigidly followed. So if rituals based upon beliefs in spirits and witches represent the origins of religion, can we find the origins of atheism in these primitive communities? In these pre-literate communities, would there be anything which corresponded to in what in literate communities would be the village atheist? Is there a village skeptic? No, I don't think there would be a village skeptic. What there is, there are characters of that kind who would have become the village skeptic or the atheist in modern context. But in that kind of context, that's not really a role that you could choose. So why not? No. Well, because the kind of person who would say that witches do not exist, or that anti-witchcraft rituals are a joke would be suspected of being a witch would be who but a witch would go around saying there's no such thing as witchcraft so that even in very simple pre-literate communities with relatively simple social mm -hmm. structures uh, there is a, a close relationship between uh, village authority mm -hmm. and village belief well, very much so. I mean, you know, most of those places are places where you do ancestor cult, and ancestor cults are cults about dead old men, organized by living old men who have authority over everyone else. So one of the problems we have in telling the story of disbelief is that even in the most elementary social arrangements, religious belief became almost inevitably associated with authority and power and as those social arrangements became more complex with patriotism. Thousands of years later nowhere is this association more obvious in the Western world today than it is in the United States of America and few commentators have observed the phenomenon with more skepticism than the American playwright Arthur Miller. Certainly the, uh, the religious uh, overlay of patriotism has come into fashion. It's always there, of course, in this country. We, more people go to church here than I think anywhere. But uh, it's gotten heavier now. Do you think that's, is that since 9-11, or do you think... It was always here, but it's gotten thicker, it's gotten heavier, because it's such an easy way to, to cuddle up to the, what they think the majority is about. I mean, they've convinced a lot of people to forget that this country was founded by people who were really escaping the domination of a governmental religion and uh, who breathe freely here with great with gratitude that they didn't have to obey a church. And one also gets the impression that that the enterprise in Iraq had a sort of faith-based oh, yeah. patriotism. It wasn't just patriotic, right. it was they, Christian uh, patriotic. Of course in wartime I suppose we did that in the Second World War to a degree but it was never laid on with a trowel this way. Uh, this is now being used as a means of persuasion. Uh, it's patent, it's obvious. Uh, they call upon God to initiate a program, whatever it may be. They lard it over with some religious verbiage to make it seem as though if you oppose this, you oppose the Lord. There are a lot of Americans, I think they're a minority, but they're very vocal, are really aching for an Ayatollah. And what Americans are aching for, certain American presidents are tempted to supply. Certainly in 1987, President George Bush, senior, stated that people who did not believe in God might have, at best, questionable rights to American citizenship. I don't know that atheists should be considered as patriots, nor should they be considered as citizens. So, in the United States, no public figure, and certainly no one who wished to enjoy popularity as a politician, could risk it being said that he or she was a dis-